Thank you for joining us tonight for the lesson from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, that we've entitled, Feeling Welcome at Church. We hope you find it encouraging. God bless. I love the Pace Church of Christ. I love the people here. I love their devotion to their Lord and their, and their appreciation for each other. As I've talked to many of them by phone or text or email over the past couple of weeks, uh, they've all said pretty much the same thing, that they miss being together. Oh, they're enjoying the video lessons and they're enjoying other things that they're finding online. But it's not quite the same as gathering together as people who love each other and who love the Lord and lifting up praise to him. It's not the same as being able to give that handshake or that hug or to catch up on the small talk. Uh, we sometimes forget that all of that is part of the fellowship of the church. And that fellowship is so sacred and so special. And, and being in touch with each other as we make calls and so forth, it's, it's one way we can deal with that. But it's not the same as being face to face in person with that individual. Well, tonight we're going to talk from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, in a lesson that I've entitled, Feeling Welcome at Church. And this lesson is, is based on a text where James is dealing with partiality, where he's dealing with folks in the church showing favoritism to this person or that person or to this group or that group. Again, one of the things that I love about the Pace Church of Christ is it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter what your educational level is. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. When you walk in the door of the building, you are a brother or a sister in Jesus Christ who's been created in the image of God and given the glory and the honor that God has given to all his creation. So as we walk through this lesson tonight, we're going to talk about how to protect that sacred fellowship and how to have experiences where all of us are encouraged by being together. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. In James chapter 2, verse 1, James tells us that we are not to show partiality. We are not to show favoritism to one group or to another group. Apparently, that was an issue that was going on in the early church. Uh, our culture today, while there are similarities, was very different from the first century Roman culture. Uh, in that time frame where we have a middle class today and there are folks on either extreme as far as wealth and prosperity, most of the people in the first century were lower class. Uh, they did not have the resources and the funding uh, that maybe that small, small percentage of wealthy folks did in that culture. And there wasn't much of what we would call a middle class during that time frame. So you really were one of those individuals that was a have, you had plenty of resources, but most folks, the vast majority of folks were the have nots. Uh, the Roman empire was also made up of a plurality of people, people from all over the world, people who had all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, we read a lot in the New Testament about the struggle between folks with Jewish backgrounds and those with Gentile backgrounds. Uh, there was a different mindset as far as men and women and the way that the culture as a whole viewed women in the first century. Uh, by the way, one of the misconceptions is that, uh, that those in the church look down on women. Uh, the, the opposite is actually true. It was with the coming of Christianity uh, that women were viewed with the dignity with which God gave them. So whether you're talking about gender biases, whether you're talking about economic discrimination, or whether you're talking about social ethnic backgrounds, the first century was filled with a lot of favoritism. This is my group. These are my people. 
And in saying that, it often meant that others were excluded. We are told by James that we are to hold on to the faith of Jesus Christ, but not to hold on to it with partiality. The one thing that all of us share in common is that we are sinners and that every one of us is in need of the salvation that only our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, can bring. And it doesn't matter how many degrees we have or if we have none at all. It doesn't matter if we have lots of money in the bank or if we have none. It doesn't matter if we live in an expensive home or if we don't. Our background brings us, draws us to Jesus Christ because he is the only one that can meet the need of our heart and of our soul. So we are to hold on to that faith. We are to value and esteem this church that Jesus himself gave his blood for. Uh, we are to be people that are committed to each other and see beyond just what the externals might be. James 2, verses 2 through 4. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you sit there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 record James is saying that we need to look beyond the exterior. Every one of us is guilty from time to time of putting up a facade, a, a mask that hides what's really lying beneath. Uh, every one of us uh, is sometimes enthralled by what we see that others have, the, how they look good or how they're athletic or how they're successful. And we see the fame and we see the fortune and we see the beauty and, and we admire that and sometimes are even envious of that. So James uses the idea of a church assembly. And he talks about this, this view of others and how sometimes we esteem others based on appearance. So James says, here are two people that come into a worship service. One obviously is very, very wealthy. Uh, the other is quite poor. And that we show partiality to the one that is wealthy, maybe thinking that there's some advantage to treating that person well. And we show dishonor or we ignore the one that is not as well off, that may be in a poor circumstance, because we might assume there isn't really anything that that person can give us that we need. And James says we need to understand that when we do that, we've made ourselves into judges. Uh, that this showing partiality based on the exterior, based on the facade, that showing this partiality really is reprehensible to God. Because in the church, those things that might separate us that way should not matter. Every one of us, every single one of us is created in the image of God. And how we look or what we have or what our job is, does not make us better or worse. James chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that holy name by which you are called? James chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, continues this thought, where James says that we need to realize that those that are poor in the riches of this world may actually have an insight into the mind of God that those of us that might have wealth uh, overlook. It is noteworthy that when Jesus himself was teaching 
there were always those that were in need that responded to the Lord. That's not to say that every wealthy person rejected him. The early church had many wealthy folks who opened up their homes, who gave freely of what God had blessed them with. But again, it is noteworthy the number of folks that came to Jesus, the number of folks that responded to the gospel preached by the, the early church who were in poor circumstances. They understood need. They understood what it was like to struggle. They understood that there had to be a solution for the plight in their life. And because they understood need, because they saw beyond just the physical things of this world, when Jesus came preaching peace and preaching contentment and preaching joy, well, the people who, in their mind, had it all weren't as open to that. But the people who knew that there had to be more than what they have now, that there had to be a, a peace and a joy and a contentment that didn't come by having things or having wealth or having prosperity. Those were the people that responded to the Lord. And we don't need to, to exalt one group over another. Uh, there have been those that have turned this situation completely around and have said that by giving away everything, uh, that somehow they're closer to God. Now, I am very much aware of the rich young ruler his wealth and his prosperity was holding him back from a relationship with God. And the Lord did tell him to take everything he had, sell it and give it to the poor. Uh, but that's not a blanket command for any or, of us. It's the idea that whatever it is that's separating us from God, uh, we need to get rid of that. It's possible for those that are poor in the things of this world to be just as greedy and just as selfish as those who have plenty. It's not the dollar value of something that creates greed. It's the desire. And James would stress to us that it's in that realizing that we need the Lord, that we truly will find the abundance that's needed to satisfy our soul. James chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. James 2 verses 8 and 9 uh, talks about this idea of breaking the law. Uh, we all want to keep the royal law of God. Uh, that royal law that he mentioned back in chapter 1. We all want to obey God's teaching and God's decrees. But we have to understand that if we violate one part of God's teaching, that we're guilty. We have broken his law. God tells us that we are to keep that law. And in keeping the law, that means we love our neighbor as ourselves. It's easy to know what's going on in my life. It's easy for me to know what my needs are and what my wants are and what my struggles are. It's harder for me to see that in other people. And that's this idea of love, that I love my neighbor as myself, that I care for my neighbor, that I try to understand what he or she is going through. I try to understand that their circumstance may not be what my circumstance is. So instead of showing partiality because of what my neighbor has or doesn't have or what my neighbor has achieved or has not achieved, I look at my neighbor and according to the royal law of God, 
I see a person created in the image of God. I, I see an individual that God made and that God has given a, a soul that will live forever. I, I see an individual that has the potential to worship and serve God as my brother or sister in Christ. This idea, again, of seeing beyond the exterior, of, of seeing what's inside the individual, that's going to help me keep the law. Because if I'm seeing my neighbor as myself, if I'm trying to understand my neighbor, then this showing favoritism, this showing partiality, it's not going to happen. And when I show that favoritism or that partiality, or I, I categorize people into groups, based on what they have or they don't have or in what way they might can help me or what way they might hinder me. I'm doing a disservice to God. I'm doing a disservice to my neighbor and I'm doing a disservice to myself. It's so imperative to realize that I may do all kinds of right things. I may do all kinds of good things. But if I am not treating people with the dignity that God gave to them, if I am not treating my neighbor with the love and the respect and the concern that I would want to be treated with, then I'm not keeping the law of God. It is noteworthy again that back in Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus separated the sheep from the goats, Certainly, there were doctrinal issues that were involved in that. But do you notice how he said, it's because I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, etc., and you took care of my needs. It's seeing others that way. It's understanding them and trying to make sure I view them and see them through the same eyes that God does. That in honoring my fellow man, in caring for my fellow man, in loving my fellow man, I am keeping the royal law. James chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. As James brings this particular section to a close in James chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he talks about mercy. And really, that's what this conversation has been about tonight. As I look at other people, I want to see them through the eyes of mercy. If I'm not willing to forgive others, if I'm not willing to see beyond the faults of others, then why would God want to see beyond my faults? Why would God want to show me mercy that I wasn't willing to show to other people? Mercy triumphs over judgment. I, I may be a human judge that looks at people and puts them into categories and, and views them as what they can do for me or what I can get from them. But that human judgment is flawed. Mercy triumphs in the end. It is the mercy that God has shown to me that he requires that I show to other people. We started this lesson tonight by saying that one of the common threads that binds us all together is that we are sinners. There are sinners that are lost. And there are sinners that are saved. Those that are saved are those who have humbled themselves before God and experienced that divine mercy. It is our task as the church to make all people feel welcome, to make all people aware of the mercy of God to make all people aware that God's mercy is not just for a select few, but that God gave his son for the entire world. God doesn't want any to perish, 
but for all to have everlasting life. And the church doesn't need to get in the way of that. The church is supposed to be the body of Christ. The church should be the people and the place where folks see the love of God made manifest. The church should never be a place of bickering and of cynicism and of partiality and of favoritism. The church should be the hands and the heart of God showing mercy to a world that desperately needs that. Thank you again for joining tonight to listen to this video. Uh, there will be another video this Sunday from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, entitled Living by Faith. We look forward to seeing you then. God bless.